Good afternoon, everybody. So we have a talk show for you today that uh, David Letterman would be proud of. I, I like David Letterman, I have to tell you. We've got celebrities, we've got politicians, we've got celebrity politicians, we've got fighter pilots, battlefield heroes, and a wonderful singer who's worked with the Black Eyed Peas and Lauren Hill. So let's get started. And it's my pleasure first to, to introduce the handsomest man in Israeli politics, or so I'm told, I really wouldn't know, and certainly one of the politicians with the toughest jobs. The Lapid family has always shaken things up. While he is his own man, Yair Lapid followed in his father Tommy's footsteps. First, as one of Israel's most popular journalists and prolific authors, and then as a politician. Always the gadfly, never satisfied with the status quo. The world may see Israel as a startup nation, but Yair Lapid saw a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. So he took the radical step of founding a new party, a movement he calls a normal party for normal people. To everyone's surprise but Lapid's, the Yesh Atid party, which literally means there is a future, has become a prominent force in Israeli politics. Ranked first on the list of the most influential Jews in the world by the Jerusalem Post, Yair Lapid is now an essential part of the politics he once watched from the sidelines. Please welcome a man who has committed himself to a more prosperous future for the Jewish nation, the leader of Yesh Atid, Finance Minister Yair Lapid. So, thank you for joining us here. Yeah. You had a fantastic beginning to the year. Mm. You won 19 seats from nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, there's never been a debut like it. Would it be fair to say things got a little bit tougher since then? Well, of course they did. Um, and they were supposed to. We're dealing with tough questions. We're dealing with tough issues. And, uh, and you know what? I, I've been telling people who are talking to me about the fact that we are... We are stumbling upon difficulties, and I said to them, if you want to make big changes, you have to be prepared for having strong opposition, and you know what, anger as well. Because I see with me around even government's table, people who are very good at, much better than me, in staying under the radar. And, and, and they do stuff, but you know, they don't get into conflicts. I came into politics in a, a fairly uh, late age, uh, I was 50 last Tuesday, and... Um, Mazalto. Thank you. Thank you. It's all downhill from here, You're let me applauding tell you. for the fact that I'm getting older. <laughs> it's better than the alternative. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, so, so, uh, so I came to make big changes, and therefore there is, there is a lot of anger, and, but we're going to do the changes that needed for this country, whatever people will say, just because they're so, it's a necessity, and I think it's an existential necessity. So yes, we're having difficulties, but I, I can't say we enjoy them, but I think we are handling them very well, or okay. well. I'm going I'm to ask you some specifics in, in a minute, but, but you mentioned there, you, know, you, you came into politics late in life, you didn't have to, you had a, a cushy job, a very nice job, it was a mm -hmm. high profile job, but it was not, you know, it's, it's much easier, I say this as a journalist, to criticize the people who are making the decisions than actually to be the people yes. making the decisions. Was, was your father, uh, and his influence part of the decision to go into politics? Because your father was a highly regarded, controversial politician who definitely didn't stay below the radar. True. Well, of course. Uh, directly and indirectly. Directly is just because three days before he died, we were in the hospital together. He was very calm about it. He said to me something that was, at the time, very, well, still is very touching. He said, you know what? He, he was a Holocaust survivor, so he said, Yairi, don't be sad because Yairi is Yair, you know, it's an, he said, because for me, every minute I lived after the age of 13 was pure luck. So don't be sad about the fact that, you know, he knew he was dying. And then he said to me, I'm not leaving you only with a family, I'm leaving you also with a country. And so this is a will, and I'm, I'm trying to fully feel a will. So this is 
this is directed. This is, this is just somebody telling me this is what I want you, you to you do. You felt a responsibility to I your I felt father. a responsibility. And of course, the indirect influence of him is, do, do I have two minutes to tell a story? Please. It's, it's, it's just my family story. And everything which is what I am is in the story. It's, it's, it happened long before I, I was born. It happened, it's February 1945. My father is a 30-year-old kid, he's in the Budapest ghetto, and, and the Russians are already approaching Budapest, and, 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 um, and the Germans, along with the Hungarian fascists, are, are start taking, starting taking the Jews in death convoys. And they're taking them to the Danube River that was red at this year, and shooting them into the freezing water. And then one day they're, they're surrounding my father's block, and uh, they start taking them with, in one of those convoys. And they're leading them to the river. And, and at a certain moment, a, a Russian airplane lowered over this convoy. Mm -hmm. And for a second, there's a term, turmoil there. I mean, the, the, the Russians, the, the, the Germans are, are shooting with their schmeissers into the sky, and everybody's yelling and shouting. And my grandma, who was with him, because my grandfather was already, already died in the Mount Housen concentration camp, she pushed him into a very small public lavatory, painted in green, and she said, you have to pee now. And it's hard. It's hard to pee when you're 13 and you're scared and it's freezing and people are shooting and you know you are actually, you, you were sentenced to death. But he did, he peed. And she closed the door behind both of them and the convoy left without them. It was a convoy of approximately 600 people. And Ten minutes afterwards, 598 of them were dead under the ice of, of the Danube River. And, and my father and my grandma were standing there next to this little public lavatory. And they were free. They could go anywhere. I mean, in the American Midwest, there were thousands of miles that nobody set foot in. And in, in, in Australia, I flew once from, from Melbourne to Perth. You fly for five hours, you don't see a single soul. And, and they could go anywhere, but they had nowhere to go to. So they went back to the ghetto, hoping only that the Russians will come before the next death convoy will take place. And, and many years later, in 86, I, I went with, uh, with my father to Budapest. It was his first time there since the war, and he was happy. But one day, we were, we were just strolling down the street, and suddenly he stopped, and he looked at something, and he starts crying. And, and you showed my father on the big screen. Right. He was a big guy. So it's, it's weird, it's this huge red-faced guy crying, and he says, yeah, here, 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 look, 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 and I'm looking and there's nothing there, it's an empty street, the only thing I can see is a small public lavatory, painted the green, that is still there. Unbelievable. And, and when he relaxed a bit, he said to me, this is the place you were born at, actually, and I was reborn, and this is the place my Zionism was born at, because this is, in this little public lavatory, I realized, I always have to have a place to go to. I need to have a place to go to. So this is what I'm doing now. I'm making sure that we will always, always have a place to go to. This is why I'm in politics. Thank you. So that, by necessity, let's, let's talk, you know, we, we, we have some leaders who make a parallel between the Holocaust and some of the threats, or one particular threat that's faced by Israel mm, today. So yeah. to come very sharply from that situation uh, in which your father astoundingly survived to a potentially genocidal threat to Israel today. What's your take on, on, on whether the Iranians are going to get to the bomb, on whether the Americans are handling this properly, on whether Israel is overly alarmist or too sanguine? What's your sense? Well, first, and maybe foremost, I, I, I refuse to accept the compulsion. We are sitting here in the free capital of a free country. We have one of the best armies in the world, and we came here because no one will scare us that easily anymore. We have the abilities, the capabilities, and the will to protect ourselves. So, so there is a difference between being very worried that we are then, and, and, be, and panicking, which we are not. It's a situation, we have to handle this. We have to make sure uh, uh, Iran will not have uh, uh, nuclear power. 
uh, because we know, we just recently saw in Syria, this kind of regimes, if they will have weapons of mass destruction, eventually they will use them. So we have to make sure Iran will not have them. Diplomacy is always a better option than war, but we have to make sure the world understands that when you are having uh, uh, some, any sort of discourse with people who lie as a way of living, then you have to be extra careful. And, and if they're not going to be extra careful, we're going to make sure we alarm them to be extra careful. And we've been telling this to our American friends because they're leading this uh, uh, specific process. And uh, we're not going to be silent about this. But on the other hand, we're going to make sure that don't, there won't be uh, we won't shred to tears the special relationship we have with the United States because it is so important to us. So there's a lot of delicacies involved and we are dealing with them all uh, and we're going to use good judgment on one hand and on the other hand make sure everybody knows what we're talking about. Okay, I want to ask you uh, about a question that's very central to the direction you took in politics and the demands you made. You know, we, one of the big election issues was um, the in inequalities ultra-orthodox um, on the whole, not serving in the army and so on. Oh. And I want to relate that briefly to your father, who was, who was a fiercely secular yes. man, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And you're being gentler, I, th I think, M more uh, gracious in the process. You've talked about a sort of a five-year process yes. to, to, to bring the, the ultra-orthodox into the army. I, is, it, is it a more ge gentle approach, and is it going to work? Well, there's a whole difference in style. Uh, somebody once asked, my father, as I was saying, lost his father at a very early age. And he had to struggle his way through life. And somebody once asked him, how come you're so aggressive and you have a son who's so uh, well-mannered? And he <laughs> said, because he had me and I didn't have me. <laughs> and, and I thought it was a nice way of putting it. Um, basically, I, I'm, I'm not as... Firstly, secular. You, this was very well put. I'm not as firstly secular. I go to in Yom Kippur. I go to shul. On the other hand, I I truly believe this is ridiculous that the state of Israel is the only per place in the Western world in which Jews does not have freedom of religion. And and I think women are must be allowed to pray in the wailing wall wearing the praying shawls. And we should equalize reform, conservative, and orthodox as so. And if you ask me about the differences in style, I don't understand why are people making such a fuss of it. I mean, this is natural, this makes sense. Sure. This, this is the way things should be. And you were saying in this beautiful introduction that I think I'm going to steal on my way out <laughs> and, and use it anywhere. Um, you, you were saying this, we are a normal party for normal people. And I think normal people understand that part of normality is pluralism. And it's very important for us that Israel will be pluralist. Thank you. Yeah, that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. OK, ladies and gentlemen, our, our next guest runs factories in Israel and in the West Bank and gets flack from just about everybody as a consequence. Daniel Birnbaum is accustomed to working with the big guys. He's built his career bringing some of the most successful global brands to Israel, companies like Nike and Pillsbury. So when he was asked to join SodaStream, an Israeli startup that transforms simple tap water into carbonated drinks, he was skeptical. Really? A product designed to compete with Coca-Cola and Pepsi? Today, SodaStream products are going head-to-head -head with major soda brands in stores around the world, and Birnbaum is a fixture on the news circuit. And the company is teaming up with Samsung and Whirlpool to bring a new generation of soda machines into every kitchen. SodaStream even had the chutzpah to promote its products on a platform reserved for business giants, the Super Bowl. But Birnbaum is not just intent on changing the way the world drinks. On the home front in Israel, his company is changing how Jews and Arabs relate to one another by employing them to work side by side. In its main manufacturing facility in Mishur Adamin, 
the company has hired Palestinians from the West Bank, as well as East Jerusalem. In Beersheba, the Soda Stream plant employs thousands of Israelis, many of them Bedouins. And Soda Stream is not just engaged as an employer, but actively involved in building up the development towns of Israel, the same communities where the federations have also been investing for generations and, in a small way, laying the groundwork for companies like SodaStream to expand opportunities for those who live there. Burnbaum believes that building bridges between peoples is a natural side effect of creating a successful operation where communities, employees, consumers, and stockholders all benefit from the company's success. Please welcome to the stage the visionary CEO of SodaStream, Daniel Birnbaum. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Nice, nice intros they do. The visionary, it's wonderful stuff. Tell us about yourself. You, uh, you were born in the States, you moved here as a kid. That's and right. then you came to be running all these major international companies. Well, uh, like many of my generation, I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. And I think that defined a lot of who I am. Uh, I think we learned to live a life of purpose and create a world that's a little bit better when we leave it than it was when we arrived. So my family moved here when I was seven and settled in Zdebokil. Ben-Gurion was still alive. This is 1970. Oh, wow. So I got to meet a lot of the Labour Party folks. The Likud and Mahal came only after he died, by the way, to make sure that, uh, that he's not coming back. So that was for the annual uh, yard sites. But it was a wonderful childhood. Ended up going to the Israeli Navy, spent six years as an officer in the Submarine, Hebrew University, Harvard MBA, and then started uh, bringing American companies, representing them here in Israel. I see. You, you, you brought them here. You encouraged them to open up here. Until I got a call from a private equity uh, friend of mine from business school who asked me to come and do due diligence on a company called SodaStream. Uh, I didn't even know they still exist because they've been around for 110 years. Uh -huh. But he asked me to take a look at the company from a marketing perspective, which is kind of where I grew up in marketing land. And I told him it's a good investment for the right price. And he said, you're going to come and run it. And I did. I got permission from my wife. I left Nike. My children were, were crying. Are you crazy? Yes. <laughs> it was crazy, you know, to go from the best job in Israel to a company that no one knew even existed. And that was how long ago? That was about six and a half years ago. And it's been an incredible uh, trip. And uh, if I'm looking for a way to, um, to do my tikkun olam and live a life of purpose, SodaStream is a great venue for that. We're disrupting the biggest, one of the biggest consumer uh, categories in the world, which is the soda category, the beverage category. We're confronting Coca-Cola head-to-head. Uh, only Israelis can do that. You need the chutzpah, and we have some of that, and a little uh, extra, and you need to be creative to do that. Uh, and right now, we're, we're kind of graduating from infant, infanthood uh, to childhood by becoming a sustainable company, profitable, growing 30% a year, um, and a responsible company about how we do our business. And we are proud to be Israeli. Now, you've got factories in um, Ashkelon, you've got a factory in the Galilee, and you've got a factory in Mishor Adumim. So you're getting targeted by rockets, you're getting flack for employing Palestinians, uh, you're pursuing a, a, a sort of mindset about uh, interaction and cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we have a knack at uh, choosing locations for our factories, don't we? Um, we did get bombarded with rockets in Ashkelon during uh, that phase, and we're constantly you were hit, bombarded. You were hit or you, Not nearby? No direct hits. But no you, direct there hits. There were days when you, when you closed the factory? No, never. I see. No, we were operating you were, you constantly. You were in the range, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But our people kept on coming. Uh, we were on a mission, and we still are on a mission. Uh, we're constantly bombarded uh, because we have a factory in Mishor Dumim, which is an area C of the uh, West Bank. Mm -hmm. Uh, Israeli controlled. In, other in words. Israel, yeah. yes. And look, you know, the easiest thing to do would be to close the factory, but we, we wouldn't do that. We don't want to do that. We use that factory as an opportunity to employ Palestinians. And what started as just employing them evolved into something completely different. We have now, we have an island of peace 
in, the, in what's considered technically the territories uh, and in a settlement technically. And we got to know each other. We have Palestinians. I have 600 Palestinians working side by side with 600 Israelis and 600 Israeli Arabs. So wait a minute. Eight, 1,800 people, is that what you're saying? 80, 1,800, 1800 people, people. 600 Palestinians, 600 Israeli Arabs, 600 Israeli Jews coming into Mishra Adumim every day to work. Working together, we have Palestinian managers who have Israeli Jews reporting to them, and vice versa. We eat together in the dining hall. We celebrate each other's holidays. Um, a few months ago, we had the end of the Ramadan, and there was a big uh, celebration during Eid al-Fitr, and I always find myself on the shoulders of some Palestinians, and they can dance, and they're going to come to our candle lighting for Hanukkah in a few weeks. It's just unbelievable, and the families get to know each other. So we have proven uh, that we can respect, we can cooperate, we can live together, and in the end, there will be peace among people. There will be peace among people. You're, you're, you're basically, you're, you're em em emphasizing a bottom-up ideology. I, I want to tell you, my second son is a black belt in karate. Wouldn't hurt anybody, but he's a black belt in karate. And he's been involved in a, in a martial arts for peace program, Buddha for Peace. Israeli kids and Palestinians, when possible, has some supporters in the audience, I know. It's not always possible, but you do see. It, must, it becomes much harder to manipulate and be malevolent about people who you're interacting with. So that I understand. And that's your, that's your conclusion, that bottom-up you can build it's uh, my, it's my a, a viable out. cooperation? I, I, I'm convinced, yes. Look, I went through that transformation myself. Most Israelis do not know a Palestinian. And most Palestinians do not know an Israeli. In fact, to an Israeli, a Palestinian is a potential terrorist. And to a Palestinian, an Israeli is the security police officer at the uh, border uh, checkpoint, or a settler, an evil settler. And when you can shatter that paradigm and get to know each other as people, and I have experiences with these people, you know, I've, I can tell you a few stories if you want about how we got to know each other below that surface and deep uh, and really respect and like each other, then magic can happen, and it's going to happen. And I call on all Israeli companies and, and all of you to promote the cooperation, to stop talking about occupation and start talking, let's talk about cooperation, because we can make the peace. I have to ask you, I mean, we, we live in a climate where 10 years ago, uh, Palestinians were involved in strategic terrorist assaults on Israel. How, how do you ensure that that hasn't happened? How do you make sure that bad people don't take advantage of your will for cooperation? That was a major concern when we started employing Palestinians about five and a half years ago. And what we decided to do, which is consistent with our philosophy of all people created equal, we put a security checkpoint in the entrance to our facility, and every one of our employees, Jews, Israeli, Arabs, and Palestinians, go through that. When we started employing Palestinians, we lost one employee, one Israeli employee who didn't want to take the risk or tolerate it. God bless him. I can accept that and understand it. But everyone else stayed. And since then, we grew from 260 people in this factory to 1,800. So, Proof is, people can cross that fear and live together. Wow, long may it prevail. Thank you so Man. much. I, I just want to thank everyone for coming to Israel. You, know, you don't know how important it is uh, that we get guests from overseas who, who uh, support us here in Israel. And I speak as an Israeli now, a father of four. Keep on coming. Send your friends to bar mitzvah trips here. I don't know, buy Israeli bonds and make contributions to Tali. And there's one more thing you can do. When you get home, and it doesn't matter if it's in Warsaw or in Prague, London, Paris, Philadelphia, or New York, go get yourselves and your friends and family a soda stream. <laughs> I will love it. I will love you for it, and so will they. Thank very you very good. much. Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Daniel Birnbaum, everybody. Our next guest has always been a high flyer. When he jumped from a Nazi train bound for a concentration camp, making a treacherous trip through Europe to Israel, Moshe Shkedi never dreamed that he would live to have a son who is one of the most important figures representing the Jewish state. Eliezer Shkedi's climb from the son of refugees to the head of the Israeli Air Force and ultimately to the helm of one of Israel's flagship national symbols was inspired by his father's simple directive 
always contribute to what he called the biggest miracle of the world. Without fanfare, Shkady quietly rose through the ranks of Israel's defense forces to Major General and then Commander-in-Chief of the Israeli Air Force. He was tapped to tackle one of the greatest existential challenges of a nuclear-armed Iran. How do you characterize the threat from Iran? I think it's a very serious threat to the state of Israel, but more than this, to the whole world. With a career built on taking on Israel's most pressing defense issues, it's not surprising that when Shkady retired from the Air Force, he was not ready to give up his commitment to building Israel's future. His new job was at the helm of El Al and has played an integral role in many key moments in the history of the Jewish state. Shkady has continued this tradition. He has deployed El Al employees as ambassadors in collaboration with the Jewish Agency, championed a unique frequent flyer, a project that, rather than merely accruing miles, allows millions of members to support important causes in Israel. From the son of a refugee to military commander, to the CEO of one of Israel's most iconic companies. Eliezer Shkady's story is all his own. But his story is also the story of federations and the partner agencies we support. JDC made Moshe Shkady's escape from Europe possible, and the Jewish agency helped his family get their start in Israel. Please welcome to the stage the CEO of El Al, and former Commander-in-Chief of the Israeli Air Force, Eliezer Shkady. How nice to see you again. Thank you, thank you for joining us. It's lovely to see you again. The last time, I don't know if you remember this, I interviewed you years ago when you were commanding the Air Force. We had a very long interview and you were telling me about the Hamas rocket crews and how the Israeli Air Force was trying to prevent them firing without harming innocent people and so on. It's been a few years since then. But let me ask you, you know, apropos both of your, your, your major jobs, you're up in the sky. Does Israel look different from there? What, what do you see that's different when you're at you know, many thousands of feet that we don't see on the ground? Not only from the sky, I would like to tell you that I think that we have the most beautiful place on earth. I mean it. And I do not hesitate to say it loud and clear to you and to all of you, and not only to us as the Jewish nation, but to the whole world. I think that we established uh, an amazing country, really, a state of the art in each and every area. And uh, honestly, I'm very proud. It's very small though, right? That, do you see that when you're, when you're way up? I, I remember my brother-in-law, who's an Israeli diplomat, was on, was on the first time that George W. Bush came to Israel, and he took the helicopter, and they showed him you know, the dimensions of the country, and he saw the Jordan, and he said, that's the mighty Jordan. He couldn't believe how small the country is. It's really very small. And I would like to, to tell you a, a story about how to explain how small it is. I studied in the Naval Postgraduate School in uh, Monterey, California. And I had to talk a little bit about Israel. And I tried to realize how to let them understand about the sizes. So I took my car and I drove from the Naval Postgraduate School to the nearest mall. And it was the same distance from the uh, West Bank to the sea. It's really unbelievable. Nine miles wide, right, at our narrowest point. That's the situation. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me ask you, you know, we, we saw in the introduction there you were on 60 Minutes and they asked you about Iran. You know, you're not the Air Force commander now, so you can speak freely about the nature of Israel's military option should it be required and your thoughts on Iran. First of all, I really think that Iran is a serious issue. A serious issue for the state of Israel and a serious issue for the whole world. 
Uh, I think personally that we should do everything in order to prevent them to get uh, nuclear capability. Everything. Everything. Uh, everything should be on table. And I personally believe that we should do it at least at the beginning with the United States. The United States is the superpower, and I believe that we should do it together. But at the end, you know, the Prime Minister of Israel is the leader of the State of Israel and of the Jewish nation all around the world. And uh, at the end, he should uh, look at the mirror and uh, understand that he's doing the right thing. Everything on table. Now, you'll choose not to go into the details, I'm sure, but as somebody who was the commander of the Air Force, there are people who think that maybe Israel does not have a capacity to dramatically impact the Iranian program. You can understand that I will not say a word and about it. you understand it. that I have to ask you. That's okay. It's yeah. okay. You're asking, I'm uh, answering. Ducking. I think that until now, in each and every time that we had to deal with nuclear capability, one in Iraq and uh, one in according to, uh, let's say, other sources in Syria, we dealt with it. So I think that uh, it should be on table, and I believe personally that at the end, the Prime Minister and the, minister, uh, the ministers and the government of Israel will decide the right decision. Okay, now we don't have much time, and there's, there are lots of questions I ought to ask you, but there's one I kind of have to ask you. You're running El Al, for goodness sake, right? Are, are we different in, in the skies, the Israelis, as passengers? Are we just a joy, <laughs> are we a joy to work with, or, or, or some, something a little different? You know, I'm not a religious person, but I would like to tell you, I think, uh, first of all, it's a great honor for me, first of all, to be the commander of the Israeli Air Force, or as my father said, the commander of the Israeli Air Force and of the Jewish Nation Air Force, and now to lead the civilian wings of the State of Israel and of the Jewish Nation. Uh, we are doing a lot in order that each and every Jew will enter to the airplane and feel at home. It means we are serving kosher meals, we do not fly in Shabbat. It's very complicated from the commercial point of view. But honestly, I really believe that this is something that we must do if we would like to be the civilian wings of the Jewish nation. Okay, lovely. Please, please don't go, General Shady. I'd like you to stay there while, while we introduce our next guest, who is really a very special Israeli hero. When Ziv Shilon walks into a school or business to talk about leadership, everyone listens. The youngest company commander in the IDF, the 25-year-old often recounts the harrowing story of his last mission at the Gaza border. Ziv was supposed to go on vacation the next day, but his unit was called to check out a serious threat. Several days of foggy conditions had made the border a prime target for hidden bombs. Not wanting to take unnecessary risk, Ziv decided to keep his team back several hundred yards as he approached the fence. As he reached for a suspicious opening, a powerful blast blew Ziv backwards to the ground. He suddenly became aware of searing pain and discovered his hands were blown away. These mist-covered mountains. Despite 10 surgeries, the loss of one arm, and permanent damage to the other, Ziv is committed to returning to his IDF command position. His dedication to the defense of Israel and the central role the army plays in forging bonds between Israelis of all walks of life, immigrants and sabras, old and young, remains unabated. Ziv's story is that of the quintessential sabra, the native-born son of immigrants from Tunis and Iraq was raised in a desert development town, grew up playing basketball, and made his way through the army to become the youngest company commander in the IDF. But his story is also the story of federations and the partner agencies we support. When North African Jews like his parents fled the violence and anti-Semitism that erupted after Israel's independence, it was the JDC that offered relief, and the Jewish agency that helped airlift them to Israel. Through these fields of and the outlying town he was raised in? Today, it is the thriving metropolis of Beersheba, home of Ben-Gurion University, 
and a city where generations of Federation support is visible in its school playgrounds and community centers. But more importantly, in the eyes of its young people touched by our programs. A leader, a soldier, a son of Zion. Please welcome to the stage Captain Ziv Shilon. So I want to begin with a, a very banal, simple question. How are you? <laughs> First of all, I'm uh, great. Great to be here. Great um, to see all these uh, lovely people here in Israel. Uh, people ca who cares about Israel. And um, this is the strongest uh, feeling that I um, can feel by seeing this all uh, youth and uh, lovely pe people here. And, and tell us a little about what you've been doing since, uh, uh, since the injury. So, um, actually, it's uh, something like uh, five uh, months ago uh, when I uh, uh, been in the last time in the, at the hospital. Uh, in, uh, now I'm actually in the middle of rehabilitation at Tel Shomer Hospital. Um, that is the main uh, idea is to make sure that my right hand will come back to uh, to function it. And um, in this time now I'm uh, studying the law school at IDC Ertelia. And uh, <laughs> who may have one or two people in the audience, perhaps? Yeah. And I. Um, Speaking a lot with the commanders and soldiers and the young Israelis about the importance of uh, getting into uh, involvement of IDF and getting into a great and serious uh, volunteering on IDF. This is uh, our main uh, cause of living, I think, here in Israel. I mean, it's the only reason that we're able to be mm -hmm. safe here in Israel, absolutely. Let me ask you, you know, we hear a lot about supposedly younger generations that are not as committed or not as patriotic. Is that your experience or do you find that, uh, that people uh, understand the imperative, the need to serve in the army and they're very motivated? Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think it's quite true. I uh, think that... Uh, my generation is, have a very strong connection with the state of Israel. And um, our uh, youth movement and uh, uh, our uh, organization of uh, charity, uh, running by, by young men, are uh, working all day long to make sure that some population in Israel will be, uh, will be able to live here a uh, good life. And uh, I saw many uh, commanders, young commanders, and many young uh, soldiers in the IDF that willing to give their life for this country without any doubts. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the last line, I think. This is the, the what points on a, a good youth here that uh, managed to, to make a, a great change about the way um, young people attach to Israel. Let, let me ask you, General Shkedi, that's, that was your experience, you know, running a, 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 a branch of the, of the Israeli army. Did you find people are, they understand why, why they're in the army, they're highly motivated? I think that uh, they understand that we are fighting for our life. You know, uh, according to the history of, uh, I assume, most of the people here, or all of them, we understand the meaning of the State of Israel. It's not a, just a phrase. It's something deep inside of all of us. 
And I believe that uh, what, can we, uh, what we see here is a great example to what our young people believe and uh, according to what they are doing uh, in their lives and uh, in the army, in the Air Force. So it's for all of us. It's not a symbolic issue. It's something deep in ourselves. Ziv, let me ask you, you you've, also, you've been speaking abroad, am I right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, this is a, an event where uh, uh, leadership and uh, activists from Jewish federations all over the United States are gathering here in Jerusalem. What was, you know, what, what was interesting for you or what did you come away with from your speaking events in the United States? And a, did you sense a connection to Israel? Okay, first of all, uh, I, I think that uh, disturb is the, it is the right uh, term. I uh, disturbed from uh, Jews that live in abroad and don't have a connection to Israel. I'm saying, uh, I, I said, think left, think right, but uh, you know, for heaven's sake, think. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, bring, your, bring your opinion, and uh, even if you don't live here physically, uh, live here in your mind and in your soul. And, uh, but from the other side, I was very surprised to see uh, and the Jewish people living abroad who have a very strong connection to the state of Israel, who support their children to uh, come and uh, serve and volunteer for the IDF, for combat uh, uh, platoons and things like this and uh, coming to visit here every year, every single year, and um, making sure that uh, no one in the world will forget our situation here. And this is, this is you guys, keep up the good work. I'm admiring you for it, and uh, can only say thank you about what you're doing for us. And, and I, you know, I, I think the thanks has to be uh, reciprocated. I think uh, all Israelis have to appreciate what, uh, what the, uh, the Israeli army, uh, um, the essential role that the Israeli army plays in protecting all of us. <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank you, Ziv. I want to thank you, General Shkedi. I want to thank our uh, two previous guests, uh, uh, Yair Lapid and, uh, and Daniel Birnbaum. Uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon and enjoy the rest of the GA and some very, very important speakers up ahead. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here at this year's GA in Jerusalem. I understand that this year's conference is called the Global Jewish Shuk, a marketplace of dialogue and debate. And you probably know that I'm a social democrat. When it comes to the economy, I support a free market, although it must be supervised by moral and economic checks and balances. But when it comes to ideas, a totally free market and a truly open exchange is the right way and the only way to go. As head of the opposition, it is my role to bring alternative ideas to the public and to speak out and challenge the government. But sometimes, we must put aside our differences. One thing is clear. There is no disagreement in Israeli politics that Iran must be stopped from getting the bomb. I'm a little bit uh, concerned by what has been happening in the Geneva talks about Iran. I fully and consistently support diplomatic efforts 
to ensure that Iran doesn't develop nuclear arms under close supervision, but we must make sure that the interim solution that appears to be emerging would prevent Iran from developing the bomb and would not only stall its efforts. And yet, at the same time, we must also keep in mind that our alliance with the United States is a very important strategic asset. This also applies to the peace talks with the Palestinians today. They demand a positive approach. At this moment, it is our duty as leaders to support the efforts that are being made now and to show that reaching peace is possible. I have to admit that with all the goodwill from the Labour Party, recent events are making it harder for us to support the government's position. I'll come back to, that, to this uh, later, but in any case, we must nourish the seeds of peace. It is vital for the future of Israel. Zionism is about a Jewish and democratic state. These are the basics. As you know, it is becoming increasingly popular among critics of peace process to talk about a binational state. But the two-state solution is the only solution that can allow us to continue to fulfill the Zionist dream of a Jewish and a democratic state. We, the Labour Party, chose to lead the opposition and not to join uh, the current government because of our differences on the peace process, on the civic agenda, on social affairs, on the economy. This is a big enough list, I think. On the civic agenda, we support freedom of religion and worship for all. That applies to all streams of Judaism, conservative, reform, orthodox, as well as non-Jews. We support civil marriage. And we support gay rights, including same-sex marriage. This week, we are submitting a proposal for civil marriage in Israel. It is one of many endeavors we have made so far to promote these issues. This proposal open an avenue for marriage outside the Orthodox rabbinate. This would be open not only to those who are not allowed to marry under Orthodox Jewish law, but also for anyone who simply prefers to live together in any way that he or she chooses and with any partner that he or she chooses. We currently have a unique opportunity. Pol political parties in the opposition and coalition are capable of joining forces to pass this law. More and more countries are allowing same-sex marriage. This has become a test, a test of enlightenment for countries today. We deserve to be part of this family of nations. I'm sure that Yair Lapid, who was just here uh, today, along with Tsipi Livni in the government and Zehava Galon, my partner in the opposition, will come together and support a brave joint initiative 
on civil marriage that can succeed. We believe, we believe in a free and democratic Israel with a strong army and secure borders to defend not only our people, but our values. When we talk about Zionism, sometimes we forget that the Zionist movement was always driven by economic and social ideals. Zionism is about taking responsibility for the fate of the Jewish people after 2,000 years in exile. I believe that state's responsibility is not only about providing security and seeking peace, but it also extends to health and education the state's role is, is to provide welfare and to fight poverty. There has been no improvement in Israel's poverty rate in the past years. According to the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Israel has had the worst poverty rate among developed countries. This is unacceptable. We are the startup nation. We have strong economic growth. So why are there so many poor people? Why is it that more than half of the workforce does not earn enough to pay taxes? This situation is not our destiny. It is the result of the government's economic policy. Many of your countries face similar problems. But of all countries, we cannot allow Israel to become a nation of haves and have-nots. Of a few rich people and many, many poor people, it is not in line with the Zionist dream. It is not in tune with our Jewish heritage. My parents were Holocaust survivors. They lost their entire families. When my father Moshe came to Israel from the ashes of Europe with, a, with only his shirt on his back, he became a construction worker. My mother was a high school teacher. They both worked very hard and were proud to support our family with dignity. Today, the same type of family in Israel would be condemned to a hopeless life of poverty. I have a very modest ambition that people like my late father, workers of all types should be able to afford housing and other basic needs and have a decent livelihood. <laughs> These are actually fundamental Jewish values. The Torah says, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof. Justice, justice, you shall pursue in order to inherit the land of Israel. To stress how fundamental it is. So our quest for social justice comes from our Jewish heritage. We didn't feel that our social, economic, and civic agenda could fit with the current coalition. But if Prime Minister Netanyahu is serious about reaching a peace agreement, we will support him. Peace is in Israel's best interest. It is in our strategic, economic, and moral interest to make peace. Sadly, the government is sending mixed messages. On one hand, 
it is holding pay stocks. On the other hand, it is approving a new wave of construction in the settlement. The two do not work together. But if we witness meaningful steps in the peace process and some of the government's right-wing elements threaten to leave, we will act as a political safety net. In this case, we will not be an opposition. I've said this to the Prime Minister several times and to President Obama when he visited Israel. The Labour Party today is playing a critical role in creating the political conditions for a successful peace process. This peace agenda, along with my social, economic, and civic agenda, is my vision for Israel. As you know, at the end of this month, the Labour Party is holding primaries to elect a chairman, I meant a chairwoman. Since I became a party chairwoman two years ago, I have been rebuilding labor to become a force for change in Israel. More and more Israelis understand today that securing a better future demands bold steps. We need to take bold steps for peace with our, our neighbors. We need to take bold steps to fix our economy. And we need to take bold steps to create a better society for our children. You know this too. So, thank you so much for your caring, your involvement, your support, and your time in the tireless and important work that you do to make Israel a better place. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.